Thank you very much. Uh, we are in Europe and now it's two o'clock. So dear colleagues and SEFI members and IC members and friends, you are very welcome uh, this afternoon. Uh, this is a seminar which is organized by the SEFI uh, Continuing Engineer Education Special Interest Group. Uh, with cooperation of the IC. This is the first time. This is a global engineer education. So I'm very happy that I can facilitate this uh, uh, webinar. Let me introduce myself. I am Aniko Kalman from Budapest University of Technology and Economics and from uh, Nyiregyháza University also. Uh, my research field is lifelong learning, so I'm very much involved in that, uh, in that uh, SIG group. And we organized this uh, webinar together with the other co-chair, uh, Christopher Smith from Glasgow uh, University, and with uh, together with the member of Rigas Hajilakos uh, from the World Economic Forum, Geneva. Uh, and we were we are very happy that we could invite uh, very good speakers for today. Uh, Rigas will be on the back and he will give some technical support for us. Uh, may I ask you, Rigas, to tell what is important during the webinar, please? Well, the most important part is, is your conversation, but also uh, just uh, everyone keep in mind that we are recording this. Uh, uh, so uh, anything you say will be used against you afterwards. Um, the plan is that the, this um, this the recording will then be available to, to those who, that have registered but didn't manage to make it today in the call. And we are testing our AI skills uh, to uh, give you a one pager uh, resume uh, fueled by ChatGPT at the end of the, if we manage to get the transcripts of the, of the discussion that will be shared with everyone. Um, uh, as uh, as uh, Aniko mentioned, this is, uh, supposed, this is a discussion where we'll hear from three experts, uh, but it's also an interactive discussion, so you will have time to, to intervene. Uh, please keep yourself on, on mute um, for to limit distractions because this is not a webinar setting of Zoom. It's just everyone can can speak. If uh, by accident you unmute and there is background noise, I will be rude uh, enough to, to to mute you myself. Um, uh, but then you can raise your hands using the reactions button that is at the bottom of your. Uh, bar uh, near the middle um, for those of you that don't use uh, Zoom that often or you can use the chat as people speak if you have commentary or questions um, and then when Aniko gives us the green light I will uh, I, I will read out some of the, the questions on the chat uh, for to the panelists or or else and then at the end of the call near the end of the call we will uh, have an uh, open space for everyone. Uh, all of you are experts and practitioners to, to give input, not only ask questions, um, but uh, Aniko is very, very strict. So uh, exactly in 55 minutes, he will close the call. So let's keep that in mind. So everybody's time is respected. And Aniko, uh, back to you. Thank you very much. You can see that how good and how comfortable to work together with two guys. So I'm very happy that one. I am very pleased to announce that there is a great number of participants. It's about 46. So thank you very much for coming up this afternoon. And as uh, Rigas told that we would like uh, to keep, you know, the one hour. Uh, first, I would like to tell something about this special interest group of continuing engineer education. This is one of the group which is very complex. In general, it is mainly focusing, promoting the continuing engineer education and lifelong learning. We are always talking about what is the difference of continuing engineer education and lifelong learning in theoretical part and in practice, not a question. And we talked about uh, in general, and we try to promote, you know, that what are the best practices in Europe and in global, because we know that lifelong learning is not only a fact, but th this is a fact and not only a wish in the future. So this is why we, uh, in 2014, we made a working plan with the members of the group, and we um, really would like to focus for the comparative research around continuing engineer education, institutional practices. 
This is why we choose, you know, of this micro credential, because from our opinion is that uh, maybe micro credential is one of the tool, which is from the new companies and from the old traditional institution can help the implementation of lifelong learning. And the members of the uh, continuing engineer education, uh, they ask and they uh, they wanted to make this uh, discussion. The session title is Making Sense of Microcredential Within Continuing Engineer Education and Lifelong Learning. So uh, when we start, uh, you know, about this uh, microcredential, uh, some, somebody told about the artificial intelligence. I think this is one of the similar, uh, you know, terminology which we used. It started earlier, not a question, the microcredential, but it is uh, popular like the artificial intelligence. So I think we should somehow to start to talk about that one with different approach deeply and this is why we wanted to see it from global side which means that from out Europe in Europe uh, from the eastern part and maybe we will continue for the other uh, good practices so uh, after that I would like to introduce the three uh, speakers I will introduce them in alphabetic uh, order I think that is very democratic and they got the questions in advance because there are a lot of questions we know. And we would like to ask them to give only, you know, some uh, information or some feedback that what we talked about as a members of this SIG, that what, what is our interest in this micro-credential. Each of the uh, presenters has a great, uh, great uh, ex uh, experience in that field. So I think that they could really give uh, good uh, input for us. So the first one, is Robert Prakash, Robert Danish Prakash, if I can say. Yes, we have two Danish because the last one is Zarka Danish is, is Danish. And they have, if I can say, a Hungarian <laughs> route also. So Robert Prakash, uh, he is Chief Technology Officer and Managing Director, Product and Finance for the Stanford Center for Professional Development and President, uh, uh, the new president of the IC, of the International Continuing Association uh, uh, Engineer Education. So, Robert, I would like to ask you, if you want to add something about your background, please do that one. You will see the questions and you have five, maximum seven minutes, please, and try to answer for these questions. OK, can we show the questions? Because I would like to uh, show it for the uh, for the audience and we can put it in the chat also. OK. Yeah, that's, if, that's, uh, that's great. Aniko. I don't know. Uh, I don't know who wants to put the questions up. Uh, mm, I, I said Rigas or Rigas, can you put the questions only to see the uh, oh yes I'll, I'll, I'll take a look uh, Aniko maybe uh, Robert you can start and then we'll look okay yeah okay. sure okay. Uh, okay. so uh, okay. uh, good morning I see some people have put sort of where they've called in from um, uh, and uh, I'm surprised to see uh, Patti here and very happy to see her uh, I am currently calling from uh, Palo Alto California it is five in the morning for me. So, uh, you know, hello, uh, happy to be here. Um, it's a, uh, I understand, you know, it's a, it's a European conference. So, you know, so, so usually the USA is, you know, number one and everything and, and everything is by our time. Uh, but this time it's, uh, it, it's you guys leading the, the, the cause. I am super excited to, to be able to talk to you guys. As Aniko said, uh, I'm the president of the International Association of Continuing Engineering Education. Uh, I met Clara and Chris in, a, in our world conference that happened a few weeks ago, and we found this sort of uh, awesome uh, venue for, for collaboration and participation. So super excited to, to see everyone and to have this discussion. Um, I do have some slides. Um, there are a lot of slides, but please don't worry. I will go through them fairly quickly. Um, as Aniko said, I'm Robert Prakash. I've been at Stanford for about 15 years now uh, as an employee, and before that, I got my master's degree from Stanford as well. So I'm an engineer, I have electrical engineering background, though I don't really use it much anymore. <laughs> um, there's a lot of information here. I'm happy to share these slides. You know, take a look at this when you uh, when you get a chance. I think that the thing I'll highlight here is 
Um, Stanford has a lot of faculty. So we have over 2,300 uh, faculty and 21 Nobel laureates currently at Stanford. Um, we have seven different schools, uh, which is how Stanford is divided. So I think th the, the reason I bring this up and sort of go to the next one, right? Stanford is known for innovation. We are in the middle of Silicon Valley. You'll recognize a lot of these companies that you see here. You know, these have all spun out of Stanford. Either students or faculty have worked on these companies. Um, so that is the, this is sort of the great part of Stanford, right? We're innovating, we're doing different things and everyone can do what they want. And they have, we have faculty who have labs and we have centers and we have schools. Um, the other side of that is basically all of these schools and centers end up doing things the, the way they want to do them. And extended and continuing education is also a part of that, right? So the School of Engineering does what it wants. The School of Business does what it wants. Each center does what it wants. Each instructor can do what they want, right? So when all of these credentials were paper-based, so back in the 50s, 60s, 80s, 90s, it didn't matter as much, right? Uh, I'm Robert Prakash. I'm a faculty member. I create a course. I have 50 people come and come to Stanford for two days. They take the course. In the end, I print something from Excel, uh, you know, and they get a beautiful, pretty credential that says, you know, uh, uh, Zarka Danesh finished this course, uh, you know, and, and and he was basically in attendance, right? So that's what used to happen. And it didn't really matter what what the credential said, as long as there was a Stanford seal on it, right? And things just worked. Um, I put this slide up here mostly to sort of show the the history of extended education that my center has been doing at Stanford. Uh, started in 1954, again, to sort of provide uh, provide education to Silicon Valley companies. Um, but I think I'll jump all the way down to 2011-12 when MOOCs started from Stanford, basically. Right? So Coursera was started by two Stanford professors. Udacity was start started by a Stanford professor. Uh, and this is when sort of online education truly sort of, you know, came to the forefront. That and, of course, the COVID pandemic, which we're not going to talk about. Uh, but so, you know, this is when when a credential, which used to be 50, 100, 200, went into thousands or hundreds of thousands of credentials, right? This is when it became really important for us to sort of figure out to figure out what is a credential, right? How do we want to represent Stanford education outside of Stanford? So here's a few things that we're looking at, right? Like uh, we want to make sure that if someone took a course from Stanford, they would understand what those things are. Right. And what are they taking and what are they getting? And if they're uh, if they're in, uh, employers or educators get those credentials, they will also understand what these things are. So I think this is probably consistent for pretty much every one of you guys who who has credentials in the university. Um, I do all that as set up to also sort of talk about um, this was a very long journey. So I tried to put dates on the top of these slides. Right. So imagine that was 2012 when the MOOCs came out. Since then, discussion started about sort of what does Stanford do and, and how do we want to get these things into one place? We had multiple different efforts, I think around 10 different efforts in the university to collaborate and figure out what Stanford's credential framework looks like. Um, it took, so so my colleague and I, my colleague Carissa and I actually spent about two years meeting with all of these different people. So again, the, the the actual names and things don't matter. It's the journey, right? It's basically, we had about 16 different units that we met with and spent time with over two years. Then we met with different faculty councils over sort of the last year. And we ended up with something that looks like this pyramid, right? A lot of this was talking to people, collaborating people, getting them to understand the importance of why why Stanford needs to have a credential framework that everyone will agree to, right? And getting all these decentralized units to be able to agree on something was actually a very, very long and hard journey. So we started in 2012 and in August of 2018 is when we finally had sort of this visual which we could get everyone to agree on, right? And this is a fairly high level visual, but the idea is if you're taking a MOOC from Stanford, you're in this red bottom of the pyramid. If you're taking professional education courses, you are in this middle sort of gray area. And then if you're taking credit bearing courses, then you're in the top of the pyramid, right? So, so that was sort of our visualization. Um, we, after this, sort of went into a little more detail internally for people to sort of 
have some criteria for what qualifies to be in these different tiers. Um, again, I can, we can talk about this more as questions come up. The, the thing I'll highlight here is in order to get all the different schools and centers to agree to this, we had to end up putting a bunch of um, sort of, instead of these being strict uh, rules, these are more guidelines. And then the schools and centers based on who their dean was could choose to sort of slightly manipulate those things, uh, but still fit within the general framework. Um, the last slide I'll show is, so um, the pyramid, I think internally was a great visualization of what these things are and how, how we would think about them. But from a public perspective, we didn't want uh, Stanford Day in general is already known to be very sort of snoot and snooty and sort of high end. So we didn't want the degree to sort of feel like, a you know, something that's hard to achieve. So for the public, we actually created, created a visual that's more linear. Uh, so it has the same information still, but it, but it sort of puts everything in the same tier. Um, and then finally, I'll say in the last two years or so, we have moved all of these credentials to not only be... Um, standardized but also digitized so we have badges and we have uh, pdf like digital documents that are verifiable on the blockchain and we can talk about that later as well so thank you aniko thank you thank you very much uh, well we know that stanford is a very innovative university not a question is a large one so i think there are a lot of questions but now let's go further and uh, the next will be in the alphabetic uh, order is Vladimir Janic, Professor Vladimir Janicek from Czech University of Technology, Head of Center for Lifelong Learning. I am very happy when I am uh, here about that there is Lifelong Learning Center because uh, we are such a group. Okay, so Vladimir, the floor is yours. Anika, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, such a specialist like <laughs> both Danishes are. So uh, we are on a little bit different market uh, here in Europe. So I will share my screen. Uh, is it shared? Just to check it. Yes, Just, we can see. Yeah, yeah. good. So, so uh, we are a little bit different situation. Uh, CTU is CTU is offering a different kinds of lifelong learning uh, formats uh the university of the third grade and so on and we are right now also focusing on the micro credentials and what brought us to the uh, to the idea of bringing micro credentials to the market in the europe or in the czech republic so when we were in the COVID time so there were a big interest in uh, passing many courses online and we saw it also in the us where it's for many years already there and we are missing such a format here. So we focused on that, that we were offering something in the short way. And that was, I think, the core idea of doing a micro-credential. So uh, offer some short time courses, which will just upskill or reskill your uh, competent or bring you some new competencies. And since the time, the amount of the lifelong learning participants uh, is increasing. And we are happy for that. Uh, one big group we were just missing uh, until now is a group between 25 and 65 in the active age of your life when we are thinking okay we are not offering any kinds of education formats for these for these people there so we just wanted to offer something which will be suitable for them so it's mostly focused when we are talking about the micro credentials on the senior specialists uh, which are working somewhere for a few years they already know how to do their job but they need somehow to upskill their knowledge to the state of the art and that was that is uh, the the main topic we are mainly focusing if you are just trying to bring up some new micro credential course so um uh, one thing which helped us also was a COVID, <laughs> because uh, after that time we uh, started so-called national recovery plan, who had uh, many different tasks. Between them was also the definition of the micro credential concept and bringing that on the, in the into the legislation of the Czech Republic. So we were start we started with for uh, we started with looking for uh, not only the content but also the legislation frames uh, how to define the micro credentials. We took uh, many ideas from the US from the rest of the world and there you know it it's such a 
in a homogene uh, world, so you can just choose whatever you want, but it will be always original for you. So then um, we started with offering a few courses uh, on our portal where people can just apply and they can just sign for that course. And we started with some pilots. Uh, one huge problem for us, and I think it will be also a content of the discussion later, was the uh, quality, quality assurance of the whole micro-credential courses. So you need to be aware of that, that you cannot just offer everything. You need to somehow assure the quality. So we made some system, it's simplified here on the picture, I will not explain everything, that uh, we are mostly looking at these courses at, at the regular uh, study uh, programs, courses. Yeah, so it really is here uh, at a high quality. So uh, for this, we just developed many forms, <laughs> sorry, uh, but we are in the EU, uh, so we have so many forms here. And uh, we are just asking, always asking the guarantees if they can just supply us with some information about how they will just uh, provide the teaching materials to the students and so on. So everything is unified. So we can perfectly control after a few runs of that course with a self-evaluation report, for example, if the students are happy with these courses or not. So uh, one thing I forgot, uh, the content of the courses is mostly focused on the topics which are right now, I would say, state of the art, so fancy ones. So we have the uh, CAT uh, technologies uh, dictated, I would say, in a good way by the European Commission, and they are covering many different technologies. And we are trying to fill these gaps uh, between the what you learned when you were a regular student and what you forgot since that time to uh, upskill the, the knowledge of these uh, participants of our courses. What do you get after you just finish your micro-credential course? You get a certificate because micro-credential is nothing else than just a micro my, uh, certificate and that's the electronic one. We are fighting for that to be able to unify this format, format uh, data format, uh, internationally, not only in the Europe. So we can exchange the micro-credentials and we can check its validity. So we are uh, dealing right now with something like a Europass and this kind of stuff where you can just store your all your e-sealed documents and you can just offer that to your employers and they can just check if you're really qualified for the work you would like to apply for. Uh, so there is a uh, in the frame of the national uh, program of the uh, renovation, uh, we just find out some kind of form again where we can just see all the information which are necessary for proving that you just passed the uh, the uh, the micro micro credential. Uh, this is just an example that these micro credential courses are mostly quite expensive because we are offering that, as I said, to the senior uh, senior workers yeah which are already working somewhere in the middle management and uh, they can allow that and they can just pay quite a huge money for these courses because we are uh, always asking for the attendance of some good managers which are just doing some workshops with these people and they are exchanging their experience in some fields of of of, of work it's not about just teaching like in the regular uh, program. It's mostly about a discussion, exchanging the knowledge, exchanging the experiences, yeah, and really upskilling your uh, your knowledge to something you could just use in your next work, for example. Uh, what we do as a center for them, because you need to not only offer the courses, you also need to spread that information about the courses somewhere. So we do the press releases, we do some video uh, video spots for uh, for for with with the uh, guarantees, and they are just introducing their courses, and people are just watching these videos. Then we are also talking to the social networks through the social networks to the participants we are talking to the chambers of the uh, specialized chambers which are just uh, connecting together the workers of one kind yeah and uh, the last thing uh, i would like to introduce is the first joint micro credential we are uh, doing in the frame of the uh, eurotech project uh, with the technical university in the munich and it's focused on the ai uh, we heard today already the AI many times, and that uh, is uh, the first format where we are just joining two universities together. For two days, you will stay in Prague. For two days, you will go to the Munich. And the biggest goal for you is to, you will see the 
uh, German uh, point of view from the Czech side and the Czech point of view from the German side. So you can exchange again your experiences if you would like to expand your or if our Czech uh, people would like to expand their business to the Germany in the field of the AI, they will just uh, know about it, what is there in the different uh, way said it. So uh, as I said, it will be two days in the Prague, two days in the uh, University of Munich. And uh, to be short, that's all. And don't forget, please, to enroll in a unique micro-credential course. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perfect. You keep the time very well. If I can only say that from the Stanford University, we heard about, you know, the innovation and they were the founder of the MOOCs. So uh, the process is mainly focused for that one. And from the uh, Czech uh, side, the process is mainly from the labor market. And we are talking about the upskilling and reskilling. I think this is after the COVID, as you mentioned. So this is another uh, approach of the micro credential. I was very happy that you mentioned the, uh, the, internet, uh, the artificial intelligence together with micro credentials because <laughs> I, I told that one that they have some kind of link. And I'm very proud uh, to uh, introduce my colleague. Uh, he's working in lifelong learning many, many years ago. And he is uh, Danish Zarka. As I know, maybe you know each other, I, as, I, uh, as I heard from uh, uh, Robert. Um, and uh, Director Center for Continuing Engineer Education of Budapest University of Technology and Economics. And they, as I know, they have very good practice and very good network in micro-credential. So, uh, Danish, the floor is yours. Thank you. As I heard um, this afternoon, it, it's better if I share my screen. Uh, do you see it? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. The building of the old building. Yes, the, the main building, not the old building. <laughs> so For we ten... are a university, uh, second largest in Hungary, 240 years old. Um, and as we are a moderately innovative university, so we have only four Nobel Prize winners. Um, uh, recently this year, uh, Ferenc Krauss of up to second um, uh, physics, very uh, innovative idea of 20 years ago. And um, in this university, there is an Institute of Continuing Engineering Education from 1939 uh, on. So... Um, we are quite used to um, further educate, uh, retrain, um, and to offer short courses uh, for engineers, econom economists, and other people who are interested in technology. Um, and for long, long years, um, it was no um, question about um, the, the certification. As Robert told, we just, um, I just uh, uh, found my, um, uh, certificate of two uh, two weeks ago uh, on paper. So um, we just uh, issued something. If it's a doctoral one, then you also have a special stamp on it. But otherwise, it was uh, either the um, format nor the uh, data content was not a, a big problem. Um, uh, but uh, sorry for that. I tried to... Uh, 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 make this uh, uh, make it forward, which will be yes. Um, and when once we were starting to dealing with uh, credentials and badges. I would like to uh, um, say that the Hungarian um, educational um, uh, body, uh, the Ministry of Education, which is now uh, embedded in the human resources, um, then, uh, oh, it's a, thank you yes. very much. No, I think it's see. not my, yes, it's, yeah, yeah, I yeah. Think it's not my one. Okay. Dennis, I, I took over, to... so you just let me know when you want me to, to switch forward. Okay, okay. Just, okay. Uh, so um, we are quite uh, early inventors uh, as uh, the Hungarian state was defined everything. So we didn't have to deal with it. Uh, the definition is not perfect, but we have it. 
Uh, it was made in uh, 2022, and um, it is regu regulating the, the state of micro-credentials in higher educational, vocational education and adult education. Thank you for turning it. Next, please. Um, the regulation um, uh, is clear. Um, all higher education and vet institution may issue micro-credentials in case of a guest student, the student status is registered in another higher educational institution, micro-credential have to be issued. So it's a necessity. So we don't have to think of it whether to issue or not because it's a necessity. And also um, it is a necessity if there is a narrow student who is taking a short cycle course in the Hungarian higher education. Um, uh, we have to... Um, we have to uh, uh, give it out. So it is no, we have no legal reason not to give it out uh, as a public data upon request, digitally sealed and digitally signed. Next, please. So uh, it is so uh, centralized. Uh, we are waiting uh, for the implementation because the three major, major learning management system providers have to implement this law. So um, only uh, the Hungarian uh, people will understand the names of those systems. In higher education, this is mostly the Neptune system. In vocational educational system, this is the f Creta system. And in adult education, this is the far system which will officially issue, um, if issue micro credentials, digitally signed, stamped, and sealed. So, um, uh, as the, the implementation needs uh, much um, discussions, as Robert told what happened in the university, you can imagine how big. Uh, um, social discussion is needed if it's uh, the whole countries. Uh, um credentialization so um, um there is a project now on going on and we'll finish uh, late in this um, uh, uh, summer that oecd is working closely together with hungarian educational uh, professionals uh, to implement this therefore which is now it is out of the scope of the university how to make it we have chosen much earlier the open batch standard as a credentialization system. We are still free to use it and are using it. And uh, because I'm an e-learning expert, it came very quick, uh, very early um, in around uh, uh, 2010, 2015, uh, we have already um, uh, met uh, with open badges in international conferences and research uh, papers. So we started to use um, it from Moodle because Moodle is also uh, one of the early inventors of this um, uh, uh, open batch standard. And when we understood uh, how it works, we realized at the university that we need one. So we, uh, in the framework of uh, European project, we were uh, started to program it. I will talk to you later. So university started to um, uh, give out credentials uh, in the form of badges. And um, the first use, uh, there are many uses, but the first important use that um, you, uh, our university is uh, has chosen a network, which is called ELISA, which is um, a, a network of European uh, technical universities. And in this ELISA network, um, we will issue uh, ELISA credentials, ELISA diploma supplement, and ELISA degrees. And um, uh, the, uh, the, the framework of those credentials are already worked out um, logically or content-wise, but are still paper-based. And um, we are just now deciding because our university has offered um, the, um, the open batch uh, server to, to make it on an open badge uh, format. Next slide, please. So I would like to speak a little bit about open badges. Uh, the idea is here. 
badges were used uh, throughout the world, uh, but mostly by Anglo-Saxon nations, by scouts or uh, high rank uh, uh, soldiers, uh, officers. But on the, on the right, you see Hungarian badges uh, issued uh, by uh, one of our ministers. And it's also clear that if you have badges, you have also a certificate that certifies that the badge is valid. So one photo is about a badge and also the certificate of, about the badge. Next slide, please. So the question is, and it was the question of, of uh, open badge, um, IMS Global, uh, whether we could use in vocational education or higher education for certifying uh, learning um, success. And yes, and it's mostly uh, a right from the States and also maybe Australia, um, even the industry started to issue their certification and um, and uh, internal um, ed um, uh, further education systems in open badges. So on the left top, you see badges from the state, different IT companies, internal training were already certified by badges. And on the bottom left, you see some badges that our university is issuing to certify many things. The first one is about an intensive week uh, in our faculty, one week. Uh, it is an internal, internal, international conference. And everybody who was listening, let's say, or participating five workshops in this international intensive week uh, may get badges. Of course, we are issuing badges for the presenters of this uh, uh, intensive week. We are also um, standard we have a standard that uh, our institute, uh, whenever somebody is finishing an, educa an adult educational course, we are issuing an open badge uh, about this um, learning achievement. And we made sure when we uh, designed this, um, this player portal that the uh, data content of the uh, badge is compliant with the European digital badges um, um, definition, there is a, a famous annex one, which is defining the data, uh, the compulsory and the uh, advised the data set of, uh, of the uh, micro credential. So we programmed this displayer portal to, um, to make so. Uh, so on the right of the, uh, the, the uh, uh, screen, you, you see our uh, displayer portal. Next uh, slide, please. So you see now here our earner valid of the portal, and you see um, a higher educational short course. When uh, the, you see um, four badges, one badge is for the participation. This is the the orange one. One badge is um, uh, just by finishing the first module, and we call it um, um, micro credential unit. And the second one is also a micro-credential unit of finishing the second module, while the third one by completion is the uh, uh, micro-credential course. When we fi you finish the first and the two second module, the issuer portal is automatically issuing the big badge, the meta badge. Next slide, please. So in the uh, in this uh, display portal, you can verify the conformity, which means that it is um, um, uh, <clears throat> meeting the open batch standards. The last um, legal standard is two point zero. Um, one attack already introduced this the three point zero, but it is an extra experimental phase, so it's not final definition. Next slide, please. We, of course, made um, a service that everybody can print out in PDF. So we go back to the original needs. But if you see, there is a tricky QR code at the middle, which is uh, driving you back to the, the original uh, badge. Next slide, please. And here, this is um, uh, an internal insight from the uh, how we issue badges. First, we create the badge uh, class. The badge class uh, contains everything, uh, containing everything from the learning um, course or module, but nothing from the learner. 
we we have um, made this uh, badge um, uh, server that we can choose in Europe between different type of learning uh, upon the European uh, framework. So we have general badges, higher educational badges, language learning badges, vocational educational badges, and adult education badges. And not surprisingly, if it's higher education badge, then we have uh, data uh, fields for the the um, the um, uh, different um, descriptors of higher education. So you can have code for the uh, learning. You ha can have um, the EQF level of learning. You can have ESCO um, quali uh, the uh, number where where it uh, the, the vocabulary of the content and many other things. Um, and finally, there is an assertion, which means that the batch class, uh, when somebody has finished, is uh, just used or asserted, awarded to somebody, then this is called an assertion. Thank you. And the next slide, it is uh, something that we have made, and even the Hungarian law for micro-credentials doesn't talk about this, and this is the famous stackability. So it is an early um, model now, but uh, we can... Um, easily uh, make meta badges, which means that if you uh, have earned one badge and another badge, then the system uh, can issue automatically a meta badge, which is certifying something in this, in this um, um, first attempt, you see um, participation badge plus an achievement badge, which, uh, which uh, would mean a successful completion. So because you have enter the classroom all the time. Uh, you, you didn't miss it, but it also uploaded, let's say, an, an assignment. And uh, if it's uh, successful, then you have uh, achieved the badge. The uh, You have completed the course. Thank you. And maybe the last slide, please. Slide, please. And this is a micro-credential, stackable micro-credential, which means that um, the first uh, badge on the left is a micro-credential unit with all the denominators that you need for a micro-credential and then a second uh, unit. And if the two units are uh, overdid, then the system is uh, issuing the, um, the successful completion of the uh, micro-credential course. Um, this is just a demonstration, but this course was really uh, done uh, by a European in the European project. It was a two days training, and after this training, we have issued those uh, badges, and it were real, really, um, um, at, let's say it's not just a test because some project partners couldn't participate in the second day, so they didn't get the big badge, just just the first module match when, when they finished it. Thank you very much. This is the state of art, and this is how we technically try to um, implement the thing. And uh, the the um, narrow gate through micro credentials that we make the data set uh, compatible with the micro credential requirements. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, as I mentioned, different approach uh, from this side, uh, we saw that how the implementation of regulation can help, you know, of this situation. Uh, so I think that was really interesting from the three uh, type of uh, this micro-credential presentation. If I can ask from Rigas that now show the questions which we raise for them, maybe if you want to add something, you can only, and I would like to uh, uh, see if the members can see of the participants of these questions. And after that, I see that in the chat, there are a lot of questions. So I would like to give the opportunity, uh, if you can, Rigas, to uh, read them or make, uh, you know, some of them uh, which can be interesting. And then we ask if someone has questions can raise the hands. Okay. That, that sounds good, uh, Aniko. And, uh, I would like, if possible, now to to go into everybody can can see everybody, and we, it's just a, a discussion now that uh, Robert, Vladimir, and Dennis have done so. If possible, since I will be removing the the spotlight, if you can put your cameras on so it doesn't look weird, like we're all four of us and uh, and a lot of black screens, that would be appreciated. So we go back into a gallery mode. Uh, now we're in the discussion. I will ask maybe um, Andras if I pronounce the, the name uh, well to. Uh, 
to to ask the question that is on the chat maybe i don't know if you you wanted to ask it to a per specific participant or uh, to all three of them if not i can read it for you but uh, maybe now that we have a chat you can you can have the question um yes i was wondering if um, the the um examination uh, issue, which is um, in many online environments and uh, situations, um, um, maybe a question, um, if it has some specific um, um, aspect uh, for um, uh, for the mic micro credential operations. Would you hear me? I mean, I, I can take a pass at that, um, and then maybe Vladimir and, and Danish can jump in. I think from Stanford's perspective, right, the micro credential is just is just the document you're getting at the end of the course. The examination itself is a it has been a sort of a problem for distance education for a very long time, right? So I don't think having a micro credential or not changes the changes that piece. So it's about creating a course in a way where the examination is actually asking the learner to do something rather than just, you know, a yes, no, or multiple choice type thing. So that's the direction in general Stanford has taken. Um, so, so yeah, the, the courses haven't changed for us at least because, you know, whether we issue a micro credential or not. Um, may I ask you or tell you something which uh, is highlighting Andrasha's question that uh, the, 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 the examination and the identity of the learner is uh, a very uh, important issue in, in e-learning, in remote ways of learning. Uh, therefore, the European Annex 1 uh, is um, defining uh, two fields uh, in micro-credentials. One field, you can add the form of examination, uh, how it was made. So you achieved uh, this or this, uh, this or that learning outcome in the form of oral examination or written examination, written e-learning examination, presential or remote. And if and uh, um, separ separately for, from this, there is an optional field of the uh, identity check of the learner. So no identity check. Identity check uh, by login, I did, and identity check uh, by uh, checking uh, visually or in any means uh, biologically um, the identity by ID card. So there are different ways of uh, uh, how strictly you um, um, check the identity of the learner, and it may apply for face-to-face -face, uh, uh, examination as well. And the stronger this um, the data contact of the identity check, the, the stronger is it. I think the value of the micro credential is higher. I I have a couple of questions, but there are ten minutes. I don't. I would like to prioritize somebody else from the group that would like to to ask. If not, I will ask my question. Yes, I think we can give the floor to the. Participants, I, I try yeah. to see if there is yeah. any hands up, but <laughs> not for for now. Uh, but so I wanted to ask all three of you. You know, we say that uh, you know, you're smart. You're smart if you learn from your own mistakes, and you you're wise if you can learn from others' mistakes. Uh, so I know this is recorded, but if uh, if you could share something that you you tried and it didn't work, and you know it took a lot of resources and you wish you hadn't done, uh, what it would it be for us that are now in the kind of uh, the beginning of the journey of creating this. Uh, I don't know if it's one of you would ha has something to share. I would like to share that would be valuable. So if I can start, so I think our biggest problem was to find the uh, teachers, the guarantees who will just find the quite interesting content because you can do many courses. And if you don't find the client for that, it's the biggest problem, then you fail. 
So uh, therefore, we started at the beginning asking the companies, what are you interested for? So what should be your next uh, worker? What should what kind of competencies he should have? And Eurotech helped us with that because we defined some competencies and we are building the courses on base of these competencies. And then if you have something you can sell, then you will find the client from that and you will not fail. So that was the only one problem we were facing. Otherwise, everything is running okay. And our four pilot project, four pilot micro credentials were filled with students and they were quite happy with that. Perfect. Thanks. I don't know, Dennis, uh, Robert, if you have anything to, to share. Um, sure. I mean, uh, I think what I would add is. I think if, if you start a micro-credential project like this, I think you have to make it really easy for the instructors or centers or schools to be able to adopt it. Like we created a bunch of documentation, a lot of templates, and, and, and try to make it easy. Otherwise, people will just do what they've been doing so far, right? They'll go to Excel or to PDF or whatever. Um, so a lot of effort was put into... Uh, you know, creating templates, making things easy, and then marketing it internally so that people know actually that these things exist and they are easy to use, right? Um, yeah. I would, I would say the 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 time factor. It is slow, so slow. Whatever you have done to push through the whole institution. Um, and uh, the example is that once we have finished our displayer portal design we could very quickly found a, a very easy um, internal marketing that um, um, in a very hurry, we uh, had to make a, a fire safety small course for the whole faculty. And uh, at the end of the course, there is an open badge, which is certifying that you have finished and they, everybody has to finish it uh, every year. However, we thought we are pretty sure that everybody knows everything about badges. And after two years, most of the, the lecturers don't know what they have got. And also one year took when the, our dean has decided to issue the dean award in an, a form of open badge. And another year um, when we reached the ELISA project to show that we can solve their problems and the um, of issuing digitally the micro-credentials of ELISA and the technical solution is there, but we have started to talk with them two years ago and it, everybody was nodding that it's fine, but nothing has happened. So the change management is a very slow process. And then something very specific for what you, you shared, you shared the, the pilot stackability framework. Does that work across institutions? Does that work with other universities? Yes. Uh, I, I saw the, I saw the, uh, the message. Um, first of all, the um, open badge standard is a standard. If you have any uh, open badge uh, displayer or valid, and if you upload our badges, and if you program to be stackable, then it will be stackable. We are also working uh, that we uh, it is not ready yet. If we upload the, this uh, valid that I have shown is uh, accepting uh, um, open badges that were issued other from other sources, uh, either for example open badge factory or other uh, issuers, uh, and it's nicely there. But uh, for the time, uh, we have sold it in our server. But for example, in, in uh, the university um, network that we are in, this ELISA network, we have offered that every university can be an issuer in our server. And in this way, the different universities as issuers um, uh, are uh, issuing from the same batch server that it will very quickly uh, uh, be um, compatible with each other. I mean the, the function because the, the data set is compatible. Mm -hmm. So for the time being in our server, different issuers can uh, put together their badges, but uh, we will program the so-called 2.1 uh, standard, which is uh, requiring the interoperability of dif different uh, displayer portals. So technically uh, it's, it's possible, not ready but yet. do you it's do not it? Ready yet. Ah, okay. And will you, are you planning to do it across universities? Are you planning to accept other yes, universities? Yes, we are definitely to... planning it. Good, good, good. Very interesting.
that's really interesting to hear, Danish, because I, I think the other thing that's happening, especially here in the U.S., is there's companies like Badger or Badgley or Credly, right? They're trying to do the same thing where they're trying to provide these wallets or central places where the students and learners' credentials are. But in some ways, they're actually, because these are companies, right, they're almost like disengaging you from the learner. Because the learner then sort of starts to think of Credly or Badger as their as their education provider, because they have a you know they they, they have a, a a certificate, they have a, a micro credential from Stanford and from Budapest University, and then this this entity, this Badger or whatever, then actually starts to market to those people about other universities, right? So so I think that's a really interesting thing that's happening. So it's cool that you're you're trying to do it yourself. Uh, that's in, in fact the um it's a very sh short short uh, um, feedback that uh we have started to do this development when one uh, nice summer I realized that the open badge um Mozilla backpack was closed uh, its uh, operation I got a, a zip file with all my badges and they told that I can use whatever I want but the badge will be good. And I said to my colleague that this is the last time I want to experience that somebody is closing the services. Um, so we uh, made our own uh, for this reason. And we, uh, when we um, send out um, the notifying letter, we just encouraging uh, to upload to us, but they are free to upload whatever uh, this player portal they are using. And we also um, showing how to upload it to um, their uh, LinkedIn profile. So, uh, Aniko, uh, there are two questions that just came in. Um, okay. We have let's... two minutes left. Okay. So, okay. Uh, uh, let's see if we can get them through in the next two minutes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Close. Yeah. Uh, the first one from Katrina says, what kind of measurement are you using? What is the unit of achievement that you are using? I uh, don't know if, uh, if any one of you wants to, to respond to that. I mean, I can quickly say for for Stanford, where we have the the smallest unit that we're currently badging for is a course. The course can be fairly short, three four hours, but we're not badging at the individual unit level. We're we're badging at the course level. And the course is how long? The course is. I mean, the, the course. I think the small, the shortest course we have probably is a few hours. You know, three four hours, five hours, something like and that. You still get a, yeah. a badge for it. You still get a badge, yeah. yeah. But I think there are the units uh, around you around the U.S. that you know badge for a, a thirty minute video, right? So. Okay, so that is not does not have an assessment element to it, right? It's just like like uh, somebody followed the course, but not an assessment. Like a badge of participation or something, right? Yeah. And Malen is asking, what is the typical pedagogical format? Is there any kind of social or collaborative learning? Uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, in, in, uh, in CTU or uh, is it because Robert was mentioning more of the, the digital online learning part? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what Marlene means with the pedagogical format. So <laughs> because uh, we, uh, we have a different kinds of uh, pedagogical formats, as I understand that. So uh, uh, me personally, I hate just the presentation, just the lectures, and then that's it. Uh, that's something we will want to offer micro credentials in with in that. So there is always a practical part where the people like workshops, something like that, where people are working on some projects or uh, project driven education, this kind of stuff where they must prove that they just learned something. Yeah, they just somehow upskill their their knowledge, and uh, it's about a discussion about the about the discussion uh, about the results and this kind of stuff. So you always need to prove that you got something, not only listen ten hours for something. And just come going going back to the unit uh, at the CTU, we don't like to see to get the micro credential for passing, for example, three ECTS uh, compatible courses. So it's too less for us. And even if it could be stackable and some universities are doing that in that way that you are accepting uh, a normal uh, courses from the normal regular study programs as a micro credentials and you can stack them together. And then after that, you can probably get your degree that something CTU is don't we don't want that because we don't want to have a two uh, two roads how to just achieve your degree. Yeah, so that's it. 
in our university, as uh, the mainstream um, uh, learning is not micro credentialized, and I think we will do the same as uh, Robert. So normally, um, one colloquium, one one uh, course, uh, let's say throughout the uh, the semester, will be uh, micro credentialized. But in adult education. Uh, we, of course, are credentializing much smaller courses. And as the platform, the, the uh, open badges are um, philosophically based on evidence-based learning, it is very easy to, um, to uh, give evidence of any kind of learning, mm -hmm. which means, for example, that if you have finished your learning in Moodle, every kind of Moodle uh, activity that you have finished can be successful. So if it's a forum discussion, if it's a, a so-called Moodle workshop, which is a mutual uh, project learning, and if the uh, the course tutor already uh, set the, um, the successful achievements uh, criteria, then the badge will automatically show why did you get this badge. And if it's coming out from our displayer portal, a very important um, data is the evidence line. So whatever you do in a three hour long course, if there is a project work, for example, in a Google spreadsheet, you just linked in the artifact that the three, four learners made together. And this is the evidence that uh, they have achieved the goals of the, uh, the learning outcomes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Aniko, I give it back to you for the closing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, it's three o'clock and we started punctually, so we should somehow to uh, finalize, you know, punctually also. So thank you very much, you know, for all the three presenters and we can see that how important is this topic. I think that was a very good choice. And uh, I would like to ask, as I mentioned, for the presenters that please write, because we have no time, uh, those suggestions, what you think that we could thematically uh, continue with this special working group. Uh, what do we have to focus? If you can mention, you know, some expert's name, it will be good. Uh, please uh, write and send this to us, because uh, we would like to to, to work and to focus that what can help the implementation of lifelong learning and how does it work. So thank you uh, for everyone. But before that one, Rigas, we talked about that we would like to make one photo. So yeah, if you can. Is on camera, so I, yeah. smile and say smile hello, and maybe with say a hand, hello. So... Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, if you can. <laughs> yeah. Hello. <laughs> hello. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, we will continue. The next conference will be in uh, September, the CEFI conference. We will meet there and you can join to the SIG uh, group if anyone would like. Uh, thank you for the great number of the participants. Have a, a good uh, weekend and nice weekend. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.